Let me begin by asking you, um, are you a native of Ottawa? Have you lived no, here? I'm not. No? I'll tell you where I'm from in a minute. <laughs> okay. Where are you from? Well, I was born in Liverpool in England. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. And you immigrated to, to Canada? Yeah, well, that's so. part of my story. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Great. <laughs> um, and did you, but you would have uh, pursued your education in Canada? My high school, yes, from okay. high school on, yeah. And, uh, some some pr uh, elementary, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And where did you go to university? I went to university first at St. of X in Nova Scotia. Okay. And then I transferred to Ottawa U okay. for the other, for, for the end and for the master's degree. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. Okay, so uh, my understanding is that uh, your, for, your first opportunity to be involved in working with refugees was as a sponsor. Yes. So Can I tell you why? Sure. Because I, I, I'd like to start earlier than when I got involved. Because yeah. when you think back, you understand later how things all worked out, you know? Because, so as I said, I was born in England. And um, in Liverpool, when I was about seven, my mother started to nag my father. She nagged him to come to Canada because one of his brothers had thought of it and said, oh, Les, and, and she said, listen, Les, we'll go to Canada and we'll live there for eight years, we'll get rich and we'll come back and we'll live like lords. It didn't work, but she nagged for two years over and over again and finally my dad, who was a bus driver and happy as a bus driver, agreed. So when I'm uh, nine years old, I wasn't yet 10, we arrived, we got on the Samaria, a big Cunard ship, and we got to Toronto. We got to New York and then a train to Toronto. So I'd have to say that my experience with that was that my mother, who had nagged for two years to come to Canada, once we got here, she was totally unhappy. She said, I don't like the food. Tomatoes don't taste the same. Bananas don't taste the same. I don't like these big shops. She wanted a butcher and a baker, you know, and a candlestick maker. And um, she was very unhappy. She missed her sisters. She said, I miss my fireplace. Now, we had no central heating. We had a fireplace in each room, and we were quite poor. So we only had coal for the, the living, like the dining, the room we ate in. And um, the, one of the reasons she wanted to come was to get out of that kind of situation. She said, in Canada, they have central heating. But once she got here, she missed all the things that she'd wanted to leave. So it was very, very interesting for, for a child to see this. And um, she, she spoke the language. There was no language problem. So you see, that was the beginning of realizing that a person can want something, choose it, and still be very unhappy, lonely, and uprooted. I didn't realize at the time, but you know, now thinking back, I see that as a very important thing in my life. So at that time, of course, England was peaceful. World War II was finished. I was born at the end of 1944. Uh, Canada was peaceful. I grew up in a peaceful environment. And then we went through the 50s and the 60s. And in high school, we start to see all this the Vietnam War starting and all the, well, it wasn't start, but you know, all the protests, especially in the United States. And so from then on until 75, the horrors that came into our living room through TV, the My Lai massacre, the Agent Orange things, and all the horrors we saw, we saw, we heard about the Khmer Rouge and what they were doing to their own people and uh, the Patet Lao in Laos. And yeah. this was a terrible thing. When you're in your 20s, you're, you're so idealistic and you want to do something and you feel so overwhelmed and you can't do anything and you don't know what you can do. So all this was going on and I had become a teacher. I had grade six and I talked to the children about war and peace and being hawks or doves and of course they all took my side and we all became doves. <laughs> but um, it was this feeling of almost helplessness, which, must, which is worse today because it's instant and internet. You know, then we had radio, papers, and TV. But now I think it's even worse sometimes, the feeling of helplessness with the environment and this and that, everything that's going on. But we had it to a degree in those days. So um, the 60s, we had this 
the spirit of flower power, you know, um, the idea that the song John Lennon, we will overcome or, or we shall overcome and peace and all this. So it was um, quite a, an event for me when I saw on television the Hai Hong boat full of Vietnamese refugees, I think it was 1978, arriving at Malaysia and they shot at it. They wouldn't let them land and they actually shot at it. And I didn't know at that time when I watched the scene that someday I'd stand on that beach where that ship had been shot at. They didn't know that then. Um, it was a horrible thing. And then the Vietnamese started coming in smaller ships, little crafts and things. And, uh, and then the whole boat people exodus was in our living rooms every night. And um, it was so terrible at the time. And by this time, I was about 34. I had two young children living here in Ottawa and very peacefully. And you say, what can you do to help? I can't stand watching this every night and don't know what to do, can't do anything. And then one Sunday, I went to, I went to church in those <laughs> went to Mass and Canadian Martyrs Catholic Church here in Ottawa. The priest and that talked about Project 4000. I had read about it in the papers and it was you know, I, I had started, and he said, let us form a sponsorship group, so if you're willing, stay for a meeting. And I did, and I signed up to be a sponsor. And we said, well, we'll take a big family, because someone in our group actually owned a house just a street away from where I was in uh, Old Ottawa uh, East, near St. Paul's University. And uh, it had three bedrooms, it was a big, you know, and uh, so we said we'd take a family, and it was very exciting for the group to prepare. You don't know who you're preparing for, you don't know how many children they have, you don't know if they'll be Vietnamese, Lam Laotian or Cambodian. Um, and we knew nothing about any of those cultures, so it didn't make any difference at the time. So we prepared and prepared and we got furniture, we got clothes, we got all ready. And finally the house was furnished because there was no one in it, he just didn't rent it because knowing that it was, it was come, the family would come. It did take, I think it took about a year, it was not as fast as we'd hoped. But in December 1979, they arrived. And, um, yeah, was it 79? I have the picture there in the scrapbook video. I think it was 79 that they arrived. And it was a family of three from Cambodia. Um, her name was Kinpet Sarai Sopan. He was Sorn Lim, and little girl was Can Sarai. Yes. Can stop? Yeah. Thank you for what you've shared with us already. Uh, but what I would like to ask you is okay. could you? Elaborate more on what Project 4000 was all about. Yes. Well, what do you know about it? What I knew about it, yes. yes. I had heard about it in the paper, and then I found out that uh, Canada had offered to take 8,000 refugees. And our mayor, Marion Dewar, who was a wonderful woman um, and very compassionate, she said, well, we're a city, I don't know, 33,000, I don't know how many were, 330,000. She said, we can take half of that. We'll take 4,000, and the government can, you know, match that. So, you know, it was a moment of such civic compassion. You can't believe it. My bank, which I won't name, but it was, the, the tellers in my bank formed a sponsorship group. Can you imagine? The nurses on the floor of the civic hospital, of one of the hospitals <laughs> formed a sponsorship group. Um, bowling leagues formed sponsorship groups. It was an unbelievable outpouring of compassion that Mayor Dewar unlocked in this city. And you felt proud to be in Ottawa. It was an amazing time. I'm going to cry. <laughs> I don't think you'll ever go through that again, you know. Yeah. Like with, with the Syrians, they did. There has been a lot of, but there was something more. It was, every, you felt it was almost everybody. Yeah. I can't describe. It wasn't just the churches. Um, it was so widespread, this feeling. Let's sponsor a, a family. So that was really very beautiful. And... Um, so, so when Marion Dewar asked for assistance, yes, yeah. she must have been surprised by, by the outpouring of uh, oh yes, I'm sure she, of, yeah, of, of help that was absolutely. offered. Absolutely, it was just okay. unbelievable, you know. Yeah. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people came forth right away as sponsors and volunteers and so forth. It was really something. There were great big meetings at Lansdowne. I didn't. I had two very young children at the time. I didn't go to those, but. When I did find out more about it from the church, then I really 
that this is the answer for me of what can I do? And I had, we, we didn't have a lot of money or just married and trying to pay off the mortgage. So um, I said, I offered because I was at home. I, I had left teaching to have the children and I was doing my master's degree slowly, like part-time. So I offered to teach them English. And I'll tell you why. In those days, only the breadwinner could take English as a second language classes, not the wife. So I took it on as my job. And I live very close to the, when they arrived, I live close to them, to our Cambodian family, uh, who came, I think December 79, they arrived. I just lived a street away. So I became like the daily contact with them. And the husband went off to English as a second language class, and the wife and baby were at home. So I would go to her house, and I took masking tape and a magic marker, and I just put on every piece of furniture, chair, table, wall, door, the name, and we'd go through the house and say the words. And then I'd come the next day, and I'd hide them and see if she remembered any. And we learned English very simply, and then we did you know, on, on and under and all the uh, prepositions. We did it that way. And so I became very close to the, to the family. And I'd say that, um, well, he did eventually, he got a job after about a year. I think it was in a bakery, I don't remember now. And uh, I stayed in touch with them. Now, this is 1979, 1980. And I'm coming to the end of my master's. It was a master's in education with a concentration in counseling. My idea was to be a, like a high school counselor, you know. And I had to do a practicum of 300 hours. And uh, I got one at a high school in Ottawa. And I went the first day. And I listened to the head of counseling there, what I was meant to do and so on. And uh, he told me, and I didn't mind doing things like vocational weeks, engineering weeks, but the fact that I couldn't have individual sessions, you saw each student for 15 minutes, that really put me off. And I, and, and I went home that night and I thought, I don't want to do that the rest of my life. And I was still in contact with the family, of course, it was just a year. And, you know, I sat in the house alone. And I don't know where the children were, I guess my parents had taken the children. I remember being alone and sitting there and thinking, who would I like to help? And of course, the refugees close to my heart. And then I thought back to my mother. And I thought, if my mother, who spoke the language, wanted to come, came on a very comfortable boat with food that was much better than we ever had at home in Liverpool, if she had such a terribly hard time in Canada, and I was seeing already some problems with our family in terms of family reunification, because they're here, but their extended families are not. And I could see the loneliness, and I was starting to see similar things from my mother, but deeper, because my mother could have gone back and she chose to come. These people couldn't go back. The situation was not such that you could go back. They didn't choose to come anywhere. They just chose to leave a situation because it's beyond, you know, they can't live there anymore. They have to leave. They go to a camp and then they are uprooted from that country that way and then sent somewhere. So this made me think, no, I cannot work in the school system. So I phoned e Employment and Immigration Canada and I don't know who I spoke to, but he said, oh, we don't have that kind of counselors here. He said, we ha he said, you know, there's an agency in town called Ottawa Carleton Immigrant Services. Why don't you call them and see if they will give you the 300-hour uh, placement? So I did. And um, they were delighted because of all the work with the, they, they took the Vietnamese. Catholic immigration took Cambodian and Laotian refugees and Osiso took the Vietnamese refugees. And when they found out I spoke French well, because Vietnamese who were say over 40, 35, 40, they could speak French. So I didn't need an interpreter to work. So I was accepted that day. <laughs> so I suddenly had a brand new, tack, you know, on my boat, <laughs> instead of going on into the school system, becoming a high school guidance counselor, I had this 300-hour placement working with the very boat people that I wanted to help. So it was like an amazing 
switch and it happened in a day. Well, but that's why I started in Liverpool. My mind had happened earlier, but the actual, you know, the switch happened that day. So that was interesting. So um, I, um, I went to Osiso and I became a settlement worker after my three month placement was over. It wasn't 300 hours, it was three months, sorry. I said 300, it was a three month placement. When it was finished, they hired me right away. So I continued working as a settlement worker with the Vietnamese refugees who were coming. You know, so that entailed everything from meeting at the airport, because we didn't even have the reception house in those days. We brought them to a hotel in, in Ottawa. These were government-sponsored refugees. Now, that's different from Project 4000 refugees, and this is an important difference. The Project 4000 refugees were privately sponsored, groups of five, and or a church had a master agreement. A church had a master agreement to sign for them, which has just celebrated its 40th anniversary last week. Um, so the, the government-sponsored refugees came and they were basically on their own. They didn't have a family to help or look after them. They didn't have any kind of, you know, uh, extra support. They had the immigrant aid agencies. So we had the Vietnamese ones, we'd meet them, take them to the uh, hotel, they would then, we'd bring them to the office to do the paperwork, we had to take them for buying clothing, um, help find a house, it was everything, dishes. And you can imagine the more and more who came, then the offices overloaded. Because we were three Vietnamese, myself, and uh, it's not a lot of people as more and more are coming, you know. So Project 4000 in 1980 had a program. They, they knew they were sort of winding down. So they had a wonderful program. I've done a whole paper on it, which I won't go into the whole thing, but I'll give it to you after. Um, what they did, they everybody realized that the privately sponsored refugees were integrating better than the government sponsored ones. They had individual help. They had five families often around them and say, oh, I know someone who works, I can get you a job in such a place, or who'd help with English, as I did in our case, when the women couldn't go for classes, which was changed, not that, but at the beginning, that's the way it was. And so the idea of having help Volunteer Canadian help for the government-sponsored refugees was an idea that came up in, pro in the Project 4000 board. So what they did, they, um, in February 1980, OSISO and Project 4000 worked together in an effort to help the Vietnamese refugees adjust to the Canadian way of life better. So we had, they, we had um, a man named Ted Cook, who worked at Project 4000, and we came up with the idea of organizing a friendship program using all the Project 4000 volunteers. Imagine what a, an amazing thing to have this group of people who have either already sponsored or were willing to, and were all willing to help the Southeast Asian refugees. So we had this huge group of, of volunteers who had even been vetted by Project 4000. So, we came up with the idea calling it the Canadian Friendship Program or Canadian Friends. And um, it, it began, uh, let's see, phase one was in the summer of 1980. And it was this joint project, Project 4000 and OCSO, and of course, uh, Catholic Immigration Services as well. Now, they called a meeting of all the, rep Project 4000 called a meeting of all the representatives of the church groups. And they had already sponsored a Southeast Asian refugee. And um, we asked them, that we said, you, you know, you don't have to make a financial commitment. This is support, friendship, settlement. And they, many of them agreed, well, most of them agreed. And uh, we had people phoning. We had uh, two women who just phoned the sponsor list to get others. So all these people were interested. It would sound like a wonderful, wonderful idea. So then what happened was we tried two different approaches to the initial meeting, the Vietnamese way and the Canadian way. <laughs> the Vietnamese way was you invite the Canadian family to the refugee home and for, for a meal, and for a little dinner with you know the, their food and so on. And there was um, no, no real structure followed up. It was just they were to meet and get to know each other. But the language was a problem. 
Then we tried the Canadian way, <laughs> which was more structured. We organized an activity somewhere else, not in either home for the parties uh, at OCSO or at Catholic Immigration. And that didn't work either. Again, we had, we had problems at the beginning of this. So um, we decided to jump to phase two of the Canadian Friends program. And um, now by this time, Project 4000 was winding down. Uh, but the volunteers were still there. And this was a lovely I don't know, a follow-up, and they, it didn't die, if you will. You know, it kept going through this, this uh, program. And then, um, so what we did is, they actually, um, when I was hired, they had me do the volunteer coordination for that program. I had been part of it on my practicum, on the three months, going to those meetings, and I was actually hired to run it as a program, and, uh, and we did. And so we provided, we, we, we had the people meet at OCISO and we had it more structured and we had lots of activities and we had a newsletter and uh, it worked very well. And so it worked actually so well that in the end, um, I think it was Max Brem, yeah, he came from Toronto and watched it and took notes and then went back and it became a funded, it became a program across Canada called the Host Family Program. So Project 4000 started here in Ottawa and then grew through that program and then ended up the whole of Canada, the idea of having people meet, you know, help and so on. So that was really, um, now I'm not saying Project 4000 was the only private sponsorship group. There was Life, I think it was called Lifeline in Hamilton. All the big cities had groups like Project 4000. But in terms of our program, it went on through the Canadian Friends and then through the host program. So that was really amazing for me. So in those years of working with newcomers, uh, mostly from Vietnam at the time, I learned that the most, there's, there's some important things for settling a refugee. And at the first, as I said earlier, is family reunification. One refugee said to me, until my family is here, I will be spiritually incomplete. They worried. They sent money. They worked like hell and sent money back. And they would never tell their families the truth, you know, that were five young men living in one room or whatever, you know. And, and they'd take their picture in front of a Mercedes on the street and send that back. <laughs> and they thought that you know, we're doing well in Canada. And um, they, there's the whole Asian saving face, you know. We learned, too, a lot about the sponsors learned a lot when our family first came. Christmas wasn't very far away, so we went on uh, Christmas Eve with gifts for the little girl and for the two, the mother and father, and we all went in and we sat on the floor in a circle, and she brought us juice and cake, and we ate it, and we, were, we had no Cambodian, and they had no English at this point. They'd only been here about a month, not even. And we were all nodding and smiling, and we gave them the gifts, and they nodded and smiled, and we drank our juice, and then we just left. <laughs> And afterwards, some of the sponsors said, why didn't they open the gifts? <laughs> so later, when I could talk to her in English, and I learned a bit of Cambodian at the time, um, she said, I asked her why. She said, oh, that would have been so insulting to you. It means we prefer the gifts to the people. So that was a huge lesson for us, you know. Yeah. Another person on our group, in our group said, well, there are only three in this big house. Why don't we uh, take a, a Vietnamese family and put them in? And we were like naive, you know? You don't mix, especially from that part of the world, you know, there's all kinds, of, you wouldn't even mix certain kinds of Vietnamese, never mind putting in, you should keep together. We learned a lot. <laughs> and um, we also learned, for example, we would give them used clothing, which was clean and, and washed and very good, you know? And they'd thank us and bow and speak, but never wear it. <laughs> and even at Osisa, we had a clothing depot in the basement, and people were brought by the councillors and would take things, and we'd never see them wear it because they, I found out later they thought the spirit of the person who wore it before was still in it, you know. So we had all this cultural chasm to cross, and it was fascinating. And I think we learned a lot. And they learned a lot from us. So it was a wonderfully enriching experience for all the sponsors. And I think that's why the Project 4000 sponsors often went on to sponsor a second 
some a third family because it had been so enriching and uh, as well as feeling you've done something, you feel you've gained a lot as well from them. And you know, it was a lovely sharing experience that we had. Okay, so allow me to ask you yes. about the initiative that Project 4000 had with OSISO and Catholic Immigration Services. How did that come about, please? Well, at OSISO, we were looking, most, looking after mostly the Vietnamese refugees, and Catholic Immigration had the Laotian and Cambodian, the Khmer refugees. And um, I was there on my three-month placement, and I had a supervisor named Nguyen Thuong Vu. And uh, Vu began, because he was in contact with all the Vietnamese in Ottawa at the time, um, all the newcomers, and he saw that the privately sponsored Vietnamese, who would still come to us for help if they needed it, and the language, of course, was it, uh, was settling and integrating more quickly than the government sponsored who had nobody extra to help. They had our agency. But there were only three Vietnamese speakers and me in the Vietnamese office. So um, he came up with the idea. He met with Ted Cook of Project 4000 and asked, would there be a way of linking in the government sponsored newcomers, both Vietnamese, Cambodian, and Laotian, with all the volunteers that Project 4000 had, they had 400 sponsorship groups, so they had, and some of them had have five families or more in them, so you can imagine the number of volunteers was amazing. So that was how it began in a concept. And then after the meeting, Project 4000 agreed. I guess it went to their board, and then they agreed to that because they were starting to wind down. So it was a good moment to not lose that wonderful, you know, rising of empathy in Ottawa. So all these people then would have other families to help. So it was a perfect, you know, a perfect match of uh, the moment was perfect. Everything worked. And then, as I said, we in the end had to structure it more than just have people meet in their homes or in... Um, uh, in an activity, we, we became we we had them meet with Vietnamese interpreters always for us, and Catholic immigration would have done the same for the Khmer and the Laotian. So you meet with an interpreter, you're introduced, you're they talk about your life and who you are and where you work, so they know you, and then you get to know their refugee story, what they want to tell you, because there were a lot of things that happened that women would not talk about. As you can imagine, the, the Thai pirates on the South China Sea was the stories I heard were so horrendous because, as a counselor in those days, we didn't have such a big caseload. You could actually go to their homes rather than have them come into the office to meet you. So you'd go to someone's home and you know sit on the bed and talk to her. It was very informal, and the things I'm not going to talk about. It would. It's so. I can't even think of it. I couldn't tell my own family. I couldn't tell my husband what I just heard. I, I did what they did, many of them. You take a key and you lock it in your heart and you leave it there forever. And so a lot of the women had, and even the men, because the men were witnessing to this. A lot of the men were wounded. You know, there was, the Thai pirates was a horrible thing on the South China Sea. In these little boats they were coming, little fishing boats and everything. So that was a very um, difficult part. I can remember um, the first day of my placement with OSISO. I'm sorry I'm getting off the Friends program, but I, it's come to me and I have to say the first day of my placement, I went to see a Cambodian refugee who'd been, who spoke Vietnamese because she'd lived in Saigon and she was rescued and ended up with the Vietnamese. And when she told me her story and what had happened to her family and to her, I started to cry. And I was uncontrol I was in her house, in her apartment. She is comforting me. The counselor who's come to help her, she's got her arm around me. And she's saying, oh, Mrs. Pat, don't worry. They will have a better life the next time around. And you know, I'm driving home and I think, can I do this? Wouldn't I have been better off in the school system? Like, you know, doing guidance counseling, can I really take this? And I had children, and to know what happened to her children was so horrible. And I thought, I can't do it. And I'm driving, and I remember thinking, she comforted me by saying 
next life they'll have a better life. They will deserve a good life next time. And I began, and I decided to go on, and I started to read books on Buddhism and to inform myself about Buddhism and reincarnation and the whole Southeast Asian, and it helped me. It helped me tremendously. So, you know, at the time I said, okay, I'm a Catholic Buddhist. <laughs> but the whole idea that you might have another life and you go through hell on this land, it helped. And I went on, <laughs> thanks to her. Because, well, thanks to the comfort she gave me. You know, it was, it's a very interesting moment when I decided not to go back to the education <laughs> side of my uh, practicum. So, yes, yeah, so then going back to Project 4000 and the Canadian Friends, uh, it worked very well. And, um, and then, as I said, a, a consultant was sent in. Uh, his name was Max Brem. I don't know where he worked. He was, uh, I think, from a university somewhere. He came and he wrote up the program, which then was uh, funded by the government as a, a, a nationwide program. So that, that was a wonderful way for Project 4000 to have given birth. I consider it like giving birth to something other, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was a very wonderful time in my life in Ottawa. And uh, thanks to Project 4000, then I went on. I worked 10 years at Ottawa Carleton Immigrant Services. Um, at one point, um, I didn't always do the friendship program. We stopped it. As the Southeast Asian refugees were getting fewer and fewer, we started to have Polish refugees coming. And this was interesting because they didn't want Canadian friends. I, I shouldn't say it that way. They didn't want to give any information to Canadian friends. <laughs> so the program... As a, just for Vietnamese kind of died out. They, they, were in, they were used to communist countries and giving information was frightening for them. So we let that program die out. And then I worked more on getting Canadians to help refugees get jobs. So job finding became a big thing in my thing. So I worked there for 10 years. Yeah. Okay. okay, at this point I'd like to ask you to talk about what types of experiences that you would have had while you were at OC. So for example, yeah getting involved in working in refugee camps mm -hmm. or helping uh, with the, the whole resettlement situation yeah, for right. the refugees that you would have served. Can you talk about that? Yes, yes. In resettling the refugees, as the thing that you started to realize was the, the weight and the sadness of being in exile from your country. It was terrible for them. And you know, even if some could have gone back, if the situation in Vietnam had changed, even if they could have gone back, they said to us, you know, our children are now Canadian. After, a few, you know, how fast children uh, adapt. A few years, their English is good, uh, very good, actually. You wouldn't even, they don't even have an accent in their English. And they said, we have to stay here anyway for our children. And, and this was... It's like a, a sacrifice and a gift they gave their children that even if, and they couldn't go back at the time, but even if they could have, they knew that this was a better country for their children. And I learned uh, an error that a lot of people made. We, the, the non-Vietnamese speaking helpers, or Laotian or Cambodian, was when the children became very proficient in English, you would address things to them instead of to the parents. This was a huge mistake we made. And the children became head of the family. You know what I mean? They ran everything. <laughs> you talked to them. They told the father and mother what you said. And then they listened to them as they told you what they said. So they became super important. We turned upside down the family dynamic. It was a terrible error um, to not look at, I mean, you still have to, I did try and learn Vietnamese. But my Vietnamese was kind of primary. So, you know, the thing that we should have done was at least look at the parents and talk to them and then let the child. But, but we would forget and tend to, especially as, as teens and older children. So that was one thing we, we learned in settling refugees. Um, of course, we learned about the saving face, that the refugees would say yes, yes, yes. And then you, they weren't happy with what you were suggesting or whatever, but they were, that's what you needed to hear and their gratitude, and they're always going to say yes. So there were a lot of things that we had to learn as helpers, the volunteers and the counselors. That was a big one. Um, another thing we did wrong, <laughs> well, wrong, 
unwittingly wrong, was we would, um, the, the women, Asian women have very nimble fingers. They're very good with their fingers. And at the time, we had a huge company in Ottawa called Digital. And there was another company, Nortel, these big making chips, you know, computer chips. So they were delighted to have these hardworking Asian women come with their very able fingers and make these computer chips. So we were delighted and we, you know, <laughs> Mr. Vu, the, my, he'd take them over. It was all in the West End to Kanata, and they'd all get jobs. And, and it didn't matter if they didn't speak English. They'd have somebody explain, and, and they were so good, and they were so hardworking. The companies were happy. And we thought, well, aren't we great? Well, we weren't. Because again, we would disrupt the whole family dynamic. The woman often would do overtime. She'd come home late. There was nothing done. No food, and Vietnamese food is a lot of preparation. And nothing done. The husband was very upset. He should have been the breadwinner. And here, the wife was earning money, going out, and he was supposed to look after children and cook food. And, you know, we hadn't thought of that. It's, it's awful what you don't think about until it happens. You know, that was, so then we tried to emphasize to volunteers and to try and find couples' jobs at the same time. Even if the wife's job paid better, at least the husband's out and he's working, you know? And, and so we had, <laughs> we had a lot to learn about family dynamic and uh, in Asia, you know? So anyhow, then um, in realizing the extreme loneliness, the Vietnamese call their country Quay Hung, and it's in your heart, and this, this country will always be in your heart. And no matter, if you never go back, you carry it with you all the time. They love Vietnam. Now, I'm only speaking the Vietnamese because that was my yes. work, but it was probably the same with the others. They loved their country so much. And this was a terrible, terrible sadness. And compounding it was the fact that there were family members who were still in refugee camps. And under Canada immigration policy, you, they could not sponsor like um, a, a child who was over 18 or a uh, brother, a sister, uncle, aunt. And for us, family is a little more, uh, what's the word, nuclear. For them, family, everybody that's related to me is my family and they're in a camp and I have to get them. So this became very urgent. We, we felt this at OCSO. And um, again, circumstances all came together to do something wonderful. A priest, I think he was a priest. No, he was a minister in Hong Kong of, of I don't know what group of some church in Hong Kong saw the same thing. In the Hong Kong camps were all these Vietnamese single young men, too old to be sponsored by parents. And, you know, so he wrote to Osisa. I don't know how he got our name, but it was just an amazing thing. And he said... I can give some money if you can get sponsors because I have a list of people who have relatives in Ottawa. Can you imagine? So we said, this is amazing. We can do this. We can find, because we, you know, still all the Project 4000 volunteers were around, we can get volunteers to come. And especially when there's money coming from Hong Kong for the first group anyway, uh, who will sign up to be sponsors to... It's usually a, an unaccompanied male from Hong Kong. And we decided to call the group Inter Amicos, which in Latin means among friends. And um, we started it. And our board, the OCSO board, was fine with it, and I ran it. <laughs> and um, we, we did that. So the Hong Kong, the, group, the men, mostly men from Hong Kong, arrived. But we didn't want to let the program die because it filled such an important need at the time. So we continued it for any refugee, but the, someone had to come up with the money. Now, it wasn't like nowadays for private groups. I think I don't remember what it was. It was not a big amount. It's much harder today to be a private sponsor than it was in, in the 80s. So we, we, we started to have fundraising dances, and we did things to try and get money so that we could say to sponsor groups, look, we can give you this much if you will be the five sponsors. And it worked. And we started to get 
the refugees were coming with the names of aunts and uncles and this and that and brothers and sisters. And so the program became very popular. Um, I left OCSO in 1989 and it went on and it's still there. They don't call it inter amicos, they just call it the sponsorship program. <laughs> very simple. And they still help people. I don't know exactly how it works in terms of the finances and the, maybe they have to come up with their own because in many cases that's what happened. The Vietnamese were working and they would come up with the money and we would help them get the five people. So um, that's another child of Project 4000, if you will, you know, so that, that was great. Um, yeah, so that's how that worked. And Now can you talk about your experience um, oh, yeah, the camp. Your brief experience in the refugee camp. Yes, all right. While That's you worked at OCSO. Yes, Please. it was because of Inter Amicos. Okay. Um, I did, we, had a num we had a list of uh, refugees needing sponsoring in uh, Pulau Bidong refugee camp in Malaysia. And um, I, I went there, not, OCSO didn't pay for me to go. I took it as my summer my own, I went on my own, but it was because of the program that I went there. And at the time, the man who had been my supervisor a few years earlier, he was there. He had taken leave of absence from OCSO to work in the camps and work. So he was in at UNH, I mean, he was at, with UNHR in Pulobidon. So I thought this is a great moment to go because there's someone there I know and who knows the program. So I went and I stayed, I think, I only stayed about three weeks, I believe, and I interviewed the people we had on the list. Not, it wasn't an interview like for immigration, but still, it was very good for me to, to see the camp, to see what it was like when I did fundraising. Because then you can go back with your slides and pictures and say, look at this, you know, we, these people, you're, you sleep in a hammock and the rats run over you while you're sleeping and you're, you know, I didn't, they gave me a bed. <laughs> But a lot of the refugees were in hammocks, and they say, "Oh, you know, these damn rats biting my toes." And um, and to have this, uh, and one of the workers there gave me his slides of the camp, and uh, which I've given you from Carlton's archives, um, and I had pictures. And so I would go out and do fundraising then for Inter Amicos. But it made such a difference to have been there. And to say, look at this, look at this family, and they need help, and look at them, and this is what it's like in the camp. Because um, a camp, like any human settlement, there's conflict. There's always people who will take advantage of other people, you know? Um, there's a little mafia in camps, then, and they'll overcharge, and they, you know, I mean, yes, the food is brought in free from Care Canada or the Red Cross or whoever, but um, there's all kinds of things that go on in camps. And the faster you're, that's why when I think of some of the people who've grown up in refugee camps, oh God, the faster you can get people out of there, the better for everybody, for their, for their physical and mental health, you know. So that was why I went to Pulau Bidong, and I actually stood where the Hai Hong had been shot at and looked out there. And I thought, imagine when I used to see that on television in 1978, and you know, it was maybe 10 years later, here I'm standing here because of Project 4000. Isn't that amazing? Oh, oh, unbelievable. Instead of being a guidance counselor, I'm not saying anything wrong with being a guidance counselor in school, but for me, it was a, a whole other, uh, you know, life that, that took me. <laughs> I'm jealous. <laughs> Are you well, jealous? Yes, that's right. And and then while I was uh, the tenth year at OCSO, I guess ninth or tenth year at OCSO, I was running a job finding club, and um, I had a call from somebody at United Nations High Commission for Refugees in here in Ottawa, and they said to me, Pat, we have a position for a resettlement officer coming up. Just want you to know. The ad is in the Globe and Mail today, and, and uh, I thought, leave my refugee, <laughs> leave my job finding, I can't, I'm not going to apply. And, um, uh, and then I got a call from another person at UNHCR, <laughs> it wasn't the boss, because they weren't, but it was the people I knew whom I'd worked with in my dealings with the uh, refugee problems we had, and, and in the camps especially. So. Um, I said to myself, well, I run a job finding club and I'm, 
showing refugees how to write resumes. I videotape them for interviews and I make it hard for them. I give them uh, bosses that they're not used to, like men always had women bosses and I, I made it difficult because who knows what they'll face. So anyway, I thought that maybe it is a good idea to apply for a job. It's been 10 years, I haven't applied for a job. I'll go through it. That'll, it'll be, you know, very good for me to help them. So I went for the interview, <laughs> and they asked me to start the next week. <laughs> I'm sorry, could you tell me the name of the, of the uh, agency that you it, for? it was United Nations High Commission for Refugees, okay. UNHCR. Right. I had already met them in the camps at Pulau Bidong, in the camp, and um, the man who'd been my supervisor had been had taken a year's leave and worked at Pulau Bidong, and then he'd taken leave and worked, I think, in, yes, he worked in the Philippines um, at some point. So UNHCR was, you know, and I, I'm, I'm here asking, you know, next week, and I said, well, I have to finish the job finding club I'm doing. So I think I started in two weeks, but I took the job. And that was another amazing thing, because I was 14 years with them until I quit because of, Eight. Well, not really age. I, I wanted to learn the harp. <laughs> so I quit and bought a harp. <laughs> this is maybe nothing to do with refugees, but I, I got a bit burned out in, in many ways. But <laughs> so anyhow, with UNHCR, I still had contact with the Vietnamese because just because you move offices, they still know where you are you know, and they'd still come and uh, for help. When, and if I could help them, I did. If not, I'd send them to someone who could. Uh, and of course, with UNHCR, uh, we had refugees from all over because my job basically was to talk to the Canadian immigration, the federal and the provincial. So I'd go across Canada every two years and talk to the provinces and the federal government about taking more UNHCR referred refugee cases from all the camps, you know, Africa, everywhere. And there was still, when I started at UNHCR, we had a lot of Vietnamese refugees and there was what was called the Comprehensive Plan of Action, CPA, which was a way of, of trying to get a lot of them to return because there had been some people who had left simply for a better life that hadn't been, you know, they'd been in the north maybe right from the beginning so that you couldn't technically say they were refugees. So there were a lot of problems with uh, that the UNHCR was trying to solve. And it wasn't easy because, um, you know, to know exactly who's who, and, and you know, I didn't have anything to do with that, but I know that the whole CPA was a difficult time, the Comprehensive Plan of Action. So and then I worked with the Kosovo program and many other refugee cases. And through that, um, in, during those 14 years, I got to go to spend, to, we call it on mission, for a, a num maybe a month, to Guantanamo when the Haitian refugees were there. I was in the north of Iraq. Um, interviewing a hundred Iranian Kurdish, not Iranian, yes, Iranian Kurdish families uh, who were being, um, their eldest sons were being killed by I Iran who was sending hooligans in to kill them over the border, over the mountains into Iraq and we had to get that out fast. So I, my life continued in refugee work until I was in my late 50s. So, and that again was all due to Project 4000. And then, uh, now I'm still <laughs> involved in, you know, as a volunteer in a couple of refugee sponsorship groups, you know. In Ottawa we have the Syrian refugees and there's also uh, Chinese refugees and we have all kinds of refugees available. If anyone wants to help, it's always uh, there, you know, the private, the whole private sponsorship program is still running and it's a wonderful thing. Oh, I have to say something. Canada won the Nansen Medal because of this. The people of Canada won a medal from UNHCR. This medal was used to be given to individuals who had helped refugees. And Canada, with its private group sponsorship program, which was the only country in the world who had this, where individual citizens could actually sponsor a refugee, was such a, an amazing model that UNHCR, um, I think it was in 1987, I'd have to check that, gave the um, Nansen Medal for the first time to an entire people. It was the people of Canada. Because I was working at OSISO at the time, and I remember getting a little Vietnamese girl, 
to give the flowers to the Governor General and the High Commissioner from Geneva came and presented the medal to the Governor General. So that, that's a wonderful thing. You know, it's, it's been, I'm lucky, I've lived in a very compassionate and great period of Canadian refugee history. You know? yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for what you've shared already. It's, a, it's quite interesting. So at this point, what I'd like to ask you is, do you ever have opportunities to share all of the experiences that you lived with either your children or your family or friends or, or other individuals? You have opportunities to do that. Yes. Well, I'll start with my children. Um, be, we have an old 105-year-old house with lots of bedrooms upstairs. So they, they were... Uh, I sponsored a, a refugee fellow, a young man from Cambodia. It took years for him to come. So my daughter uh, had... To, she was a teenager when he arrived. He lived with us. <laughs> she wasn't happy. You know when you're 15, you don't want to... A young man living up in the room across from yours. It was quite funny. <laughs> and he was so shy, you know. So the children were used to refugees being in the house, either sponsored and living with us. He only stayed three months because my cooking was not very Cambodian. <laughs> he said to me one day, he called me Mama. He said, Mama, I found a lady and she lives near Somerset and she's a good cook. <laughs> and she says, I can live with her. <laughs> So that was fine. So that was all right. You know, I still made sure he had his year. And I mean, but uh, so the children were used to, and I had parties for refugees. Um, I had a lot of refugees in the house. So the children grew up with that. Neither of them went into that field, which is interesting. And that often happens, doesn't it? Um, my daughter's a jazz singer in New York. <laughs> And my son is the uh, CEO of a, of a high-tech uh, okay. company. So that's, um, it's interesting, but I hope that it, I know it has, it still has to have some influence on them. You know that, that this is what they grew up with, this uh, compassion for people who have lived what the refugees have lived through. It's interesting talking about the, that's an interesting, I hadn't thought of that, but it depends who you talk to. Um, I've talked to neighbors, because we've been 35 years in our house. So, yes, I have talked sometimes. You know, you get talked to neighbors and what you do. And, you, and sometimes I would get not what I expected. I remember one neighbor, a man saying to me, so, so you're one of these ones who are bringing in all these refugees. <laughs> you know, sometimes you just hit that wall of, uh, I don't know, it's far right wing kind of... Um, attitudes and that's hard when it's neighbors friends know because you tend you know birds of a feather flock together so most of my friends kind of are not like that but yes I did run into some you know so I do think it's important uh, to talk about it I've talked to strangers about it especially on airplanes it's amazing how on a plane especially a long trip you'll tell your entire life to someone you'll never see again and <laughs> you don't know at all but it was, I've had interesting and sometimes very compassionate responses from people on, on planes. Perhaps people who travel are more open. I don't know. This is a big generalization. But perhaps just the fact that someone is going to Australia or to God knows Frankfurt or wherever, that they are um, more open to what happens in the world and therefore... We are all immigrants in this country. Well, I am, definitely. And everybody can trace back to the... Uh, native people, uh, and they've come to their country. So I don't, I have a hard time understanding how people can not want refugees and immigrants coming. I just can't understand it. I do know there can be problems. I'm not, you know, unrealistic. Of course there are problems, but there are problems with my people. My family is of Irish background. Um, my grandparents came from Ireland to Liverpool. All right. In Canada, here in Ottawa, there were signs in stores that said, no Irish need apply. You know, jobs, no Irish need apply. Because they brawled, they drank, you know, they were little devils in the hall. So you could say the same today. You know what I mean? It, it's not just the newcomers, and you can't put it on any people. All nationalities will have some problems. And um, 
I'm so happy that right now we have a Minister of Immigration who's Somali. Minister yes. Hussein, it's great, yes. you know. I said, look at that. They were all refugees, and now the Minister of Immigration is a Somali. That makes my heart feel great. <laughs> I forget what the rest of the question Well, let me ask you, let me ask you this. If, let's say you were invited to come and speak with a group, or, or if you were invited to go and speak in a, in a high school or yes. a primary school, yeah. what do you think would be important to talk about in terms of, of. Uh, of refugee settlement in, in I th yes. I think that what I would talk to them about, I try and have them live an emotion. Because when you talk to people, it can just, especially if they have their phones here, you know, um, talking doesn't change people very much. So I think what I would do, because I have done some communication training, so I would take um, an exercise that I learned many, many years ago and I've adapted to refugees is called the nuclear explosion exercise. And I wouldn't, once, I, once or twice I did it as if it were real and caused some problems of people in the group who were really got upset. So I would tell them to close their eyes and imagine that the uh, caretaker of the building or wherever we were ran in and hands me this paper. And then when they open their eyes I have the paper that's, and I read it to them and I tell them oh my God, you know, there's a nuclear explosion has happened where the closest three mile island or whatever is the closest. And then I, I go through the whole experience of they have to do what they're told now. Right. It's a real, it's a, a nationwide emergency. There's, it could be more than one. So anyway, I make it so that it, they have to do what they're told. And there are buses in the parking lot that are taking them straight to the airport. Now these people, whether they're children in high school or immigration office, they're not with their families. They're alone. So I say, okay, now we're in the bus and we're going to the airport and you'll go to whatever country. And I list the countries that have offered to take Canadians, Saudi Arabia, Vietnam, Laos, uh, Nigeria. I just list them off. And you're going to one of these countries. And then I, I'm quiet and then I tell them afterwards, all right, my name's Pat Marshall, and I'm with UNHR in whatever country I've chosen for the group. I think I, I try and ask the teacher or the person running who, who's asked me to talk, if there are any Vietnamese, I don't choose Vietnam. The, everybody has to feel out of, what's DPZ in English, you know, out of their yeah. comfort zone. So I, I find out the nationalities that I will have, and I don't ever choose any country. So I have to find a country where nobody's from. And then I say I'm from there, and I'm welcoming them, and I offer them. They can either live in the compound with each other or live out in the, with the general population in a room. And, I, um, and then I tell them, I make them fill in forms in another language. that they. And I, I love to use things like Hindu, you know, where there's no letters or Arabic. Uh, no letters that we can de deal with. And I say these are their family reunification forms. And I go through, I, I'm just giving you a brief, but I go through a whole list of things that refugees have to live through. And, um, and then afterwards, we have a sort of a debriefing and talk about what they felt. So that's what I do. I don't think I talk about anything. I just want people to feel what it may be like if suddenly we have to leave this room and go to another country and you can't get your children, can't get your husband, wife, mother, father, can't get anybody. You're alone. And this is what many people have to deal with. And then, then I, I often tell them the Red Cross is trying to f do family reunification, but because of the numbers, it's very hard and they have to be patient and stop knocking at the door every day because it just keeps the woman from doing her work. You know, I do all the things that, that refugees have to live through. So that's what I do. <laughs> So can you share some some photos and some mm -hmm. stories of mm -hmm. the family that you would have sponsored? Yes. Um, in those days, when Project 4000 was in full swing, the Ottawa Citizen and the Ottawa Journal, we had two papers, they were amazing. They'd send reporters to the airport to be there when the, the refugees arrived and the family, the sponsoring group met them. It was really, uh, and then it would be in the paper the next day. So this is our, our my first family, anyway, the first one. Um, let's see, 
December 10th, 1979. I may have said 80 on the thing, but it was 1979, December 10th. So here we have the snowy blast greets <laughs> greet refugees. And here is Anne McEwen, who's one of the sponsors in our group, meeting uh, the wife and baby. Now, the husband was there, but he didn't get in the picture. <laughs> but this, just to show you how newsworthy it was considered in those days. Yeah. Can you imagine yeah. the, the papers sending reporters to, to cover this? So that's how it, it was in the, in the paper on December 10th, 1979. Thank you, Thank you very much. Yeah.